I talked through Psalm 23. And in a way, what we're trying to see is how that narrative is then picked up, how Jesus uses Psalm 23. In fact, a number of um, other prophets use that. And we've seen Ezekiel did it today. But um, Jeremiah also picked up Psalm 23 and adapted it and used it. And God spoke through Psalm 23 to these prophets in, into the, in terms of the given time that Israel found itself. And as we will see, Jesus then picks up Psalm 23 and a bit of Jeremiah and a bit of Ezekiel and effectively goes and says, you know, I'm that good shepherd. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction. Um, are you up for a bit of time traveling? I was going to wear my Doctor Who t-shirt, so I sort of chickened out of it. Uh, it was a really nice one as well. I thought, oh no, one has to be serious sometimes. Not very often, I might add. Um, <laughs> so we're going to do a bit of time traveling this morning. Are you ready? Are you up for it? Good. <laughs> okay, well, Psalm 23, The Good Shepherd, was written uh, by King David about 1055 B.C. And he was probably reflecting back on his time and experiences of being a shepherd boy in his youth. And we often forget that this Psalm 23, the Good Shepherd, kind of refers back to his experience because before he was a king, before he was anointed by Samuel, he was a shepherd boy. And, you know, he was doing a very sort of humble, very lowly, perhaps even a despised job. And so later in life, he was thinking back of his experiences. And that's why he wrote Psalm 23. But as a kind of mature king, and probably advancing in his ages, in his age, he was also reflecting back upon his turbulent times and his personal tragedies that he had experienced. And I talked about this um, a few weeks ago. He had experienced murder. He committed that himself. There was incest. There was betrayal, adultery, treachery, civil war, and the killing of his son. Almost a bit like Game of Thrones in one sort of sentence there. But while he was going through his life and these personal tragedies, he reflected back on actually God was with him and that God was his good shepherd. And so in essence, Psalm 23 is about one man, David, and his God, the good shepherd. Right, we're now going to jump into our little TARDIS and we're going to move 500 years into, into David's future. He, of course, passed away many years before then. Um, so 500 and so years later, approximately 598 BC, the nation of Israel was having a time of chaos and national disaster. Jerusalem had been destroyed and a number of Israelites, the lucky ones, had been deported and exiled to Babylon. God had warned Israel through prophets like Hosea and Jeremiah of what was going to happen to them. But they failed to listen, and they failed to turn, and they failed to repent. Israel had been unfaithful to God and, been, and become like rebellious children. It's interesting, the, uh, some of the language in the Bible is quite kind of, um, I won't say severe, but very pointed. In fact, God often suggests that they have prostituted themselves to other gods. And they'd given themselves over to their own self-righteousness. And it's into this situation that God speaks through Ezekiel, one of the exiled in Babylon, so this was a kind of, it didn't really get any worse than this in terms of Israel. They'd been evicted from the promised land. Many people had lost their lives. It was an absolute disaster what had taken place. So using Psalm 23, Ezekiel blames Israel's leadership, who he calls bad shepherds. And he calls them this because they have looked after their own needs and have neglected their sheep. Specifically, he writes, they have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, 
bound up the injured. And then he goes on to say, they have not brought back the strayed or sought after the lost. In fact, he says, they've done pretty much everything that you'd expect. They, they haven't done any of the things you'd expect from a good shepherd. So this is Ezekiel 34. And so because of this, God through Ezekiel says that he will dismiss the current shepherds and put an end to them tending his sheep. However, his message does not stop there. Into this situation, Ezekiel speaks a message of a distant hope, a, f- a future hope, a time when, and this is God speaking, I, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince amongst them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, you can't be talking about the original David because he died 500 or so years previously. So he must mean somebody else. But effectively, God says, I will tend those sheep. So now begins a time of waiting and a time of expectation for the one good shepherd and for a prince from the line of King David to appear. And again, it's into this context that another 500 years later, around 30 AD, that we move into Luke 15 where we see that Jesus is having a discussion with a group of religious people, the Pharisees. So now I'm just going to pick up really from Luke 15 onwards. Now sometimes we tend to just go straight into the parables, and we don't tend to really think about what happened before that parable. And in a way, that's where some of the emphasis of today's talk is coming from. So this is Luke 15, chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, to hear Jesus. Now, sinners regularly drew near to Jesus, not just to watch wondrous works or miracles, but to listen to his teaching, because he accepted invitations to enter their house. And again, you can pick this up in as you read for the Gospels. You know, Jesus was welcome in loads of people's homes, but he also welcomed people into his own home. And sometimes I think we kind of miss that. You know, where we tend to think about Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, where he didn't have anywhere to live, and he kind of camped out the Mount of Olives. But he was staying in place. He had his his own home, but he was living with his mother, at least. Later on, when he starts his formal ministry, things become a bit untidy, and he finds it probably very difficult to stop in any one place. But up until that point, he would have probably had a pretty much fixed place to live, even if that was in his mother's home. So sinners drew um, near to Jesus to hear, to, to watch what he did, but to listen to his teachings. People invited them into their homes, and he almost certainly invited them into his And with that, he took an opportunity to win them with his kindness. I shall come back to that phrase later on. Now, the Pharisees, however, were complaining that Jesus welcomed and received sinners. As I said, sometimes Jesus entertained his own guests in his own home. And for the Pharisees, this was a big problem. So why is that? In essence, the problem centers on table fellowship and ritual purity. Table fellowship is who you eat with. The Pharisees were people who took the law very seriously, and especially ritual purity. And within the group of Pharisees, there were people who were like the special forces of the religious community, and they called themselves the Guild of Friends. They were the super elite. They were the super elite Pharisees who policed and enforced the religious laws. In essence, they believed that if you wanted to be religious... If you wanted to be religious, holy, and pure, you needed to be careful who you hanged around with. 
And this included not associating or eating or walking or studying with common people. They would have referred to them as the people of the land. But they would have been the lowest stratum of society. Now, sometimes churches can be a bit like that as well. I just wonder whether we all have a little bit of a special forces Pharisee in us. And not necessarily, we may not necessarily center on class, although we may do, but it may be on other things, like whether or not a particular clique likes that person or not. It could simply mean that they're not like one of us, whatever that means. That may be something to kind of think about. One of the criticisms of churches are that they're very middle class. And certainly when you go to New Wine, that is extremely middle class. And one of the questions I think we need to think about is why is that? You know, is that do you know, I'm not saying we, we necessarily have issues with that, I'm not saying we're not either. But churches tend to be a very middle class affair. As you may know, uh, his disciples and other people often called Jesus Rabbi. It was therefore unthinkable to society around Jesus at that time that he would violate the Pharisees' standard governing things like tithing, Sabbath, and ritual purity. So he was kind of like, he should have been one of them, the Pharisees. And yet Jesus invited the dregs into his home and hosted them at meals. And that's what really is taking place right at the very beginning at Luke 15. That conversation is very much about, hang on, why are you you associating with these people? Why are you eating with them? And so Jesus was obliged to reply to these complaints, and he did so by telling the parables in Luke 15, which you'll be familiar with, the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. So how does Jesus attempt to correct the Pharisees' thinking? Well, he does this by affirming the good shepherd, both of which, Luke 15 and Psalm 23, affirm the act of being a host. Psalm 23, verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup cup overfills, overflows. Now, the enemies of Psalm 23 were angry with God for having chosen him, David, as a dinner guest. And actually, Jesus followed the same pattern. Only Jesus invited the unclean to be his guest at table. Now, the Pharisees were using religion to set themselves apart from everyday people. A danger when people find religion instead of building a relationship with Jesus. And I think that's what religion does. I think it often sets us apart. Such was the Pharisees' disdain and contempt for Jesus that there is a pause between the word this and the word receives in the original scripture. I'm referring to verse 2 in Luke 15. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this, this, I'm not really a very good actor, but there should be a lot of disdain in that pause. This welcomes sinners and eats with them. Modern Bibles have filled this pause with the word man. The Pharisees can't even bring themselves to utter the name of Jesus. Such is their disgust. Now, Kenneth E. Bailey, and I'm kind of referring to quite a lot of stuff from him, this whole sort of section The series on the the Good Shepherd is from Kenneth E. E. Bailey's The Good Shepherd, which is a great read. And he refers to an Old Testament scholar when he writes, it is clear that Christ himself was responsible for drawing near, the drawing near of sinners who came to him and sat and ate with him. They came because in him they discovered themselves to be lost and their tormented consciences found rest and peace. 
in a way, isn't that Psalm 23? He settles me down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. They loved him because they felt his love for them. Isn't, the part, isn't part of the reason why each of us who are drawn or in the process of being drawn to Jesus, isn't that because we do feel his love for us also? The Pharisees blamed Jesus because of his invitation to sinners and his acceptance of them. But Jesus made it clear to them that the reason for which they despised him and for which they complained about him were the very reasons that led him to come into the world in the first place. It's the very focus of his ministry. Jesus was telling them that he was the one shepherd and the servant David as foretold in Ezekiel 34. And the Pharisees' complaint showed their indifference to the plight of sinners and tax collectors and the lack of interest in their salvation. So what about us? You know, who do we share table fellowship with? What is our attitude towards the lost that are personally around each one of us? Have we gotten into a situation where religion has come between ourselves and the real world? So what does it mean to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? Psalm 23, 6. Well, the good shepherd demonstrates costly love for the guest, irrespective of who is watching. The people who are hostile to the guest will observe what the host is doing. And he knows that the hostility against the guest will be extended to the host as a result. But Jesus doesn't care. He, he offers that love anyway. And that is what sacrificial love is. Again, how does this relate to us? I used to have a real, I'm not saying I got rid of this. This, is, this has always been one of my big issues. You know, am I more concerned about what those around me think more than perhaps I feel what my heavenly father does? You know, are we concerned about what others around us think about us than our heavenly father? Sometimes we want a quiet life and can be indifferent to those who need our love and our help. And one way around this is by inviting people who, who are different than us around our own tables. Now, we can probably think of many reasons and excuses not to do this. And I'm sure they're going through your head at this precise moment. But what about those who we know who aren't saved? Now, what do we think about them? Now, Henry Newell, in his book, Reaching Out, wrote, In our world, the assumption is that strangers are a potential danger, and it's up to them to disprove it. And he goes on to write, Hospitality, therefore, means primarily the creation of a free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not, a, is not to change people, but to offer, offer them space where change can take place. And I think change happens a number of ways. I think it's you as a host and you maybe as a guest. I think change is giving people space, not going there to brainwash them. I think actually we're kind of moving to the Holy Spirit, what happens during that time. In fact, under his title, he says the word, this is Henry Newman, hostility versus hospitality. And he sees hospitality as a way of moving away from hostility. We might want to substitute the word stranger 
for a person who we don't really know very well. And that could be a work colleague, it could be a next door neighbor, it could even be someone at church who we wish to know a little bit better. Now I think Christchurch is quite good at hospitality. I think you've got some amazing facilities here and there is a lot of hospitality here. You know, I, I came to Christchurch because St- Steve Norris invited me to men's breakfast and film night. And so this food is part of that. But there are many, many things. I know there's, there's women's film and women's breakfast. In fact, there's a, a sheet outside which I encourage you to sign up. There'll be a man's one in another couple of weeks' time um, to come along to that. There are things, they're not just necessarily just for our benefit, but to bring people along also. You know, I, I became a Christian many years ago for the Alpha Course, and we know that food is a huge component of the Alpha Course. And one of my friends is about to do it, and I said, you know, they do food there. And he said, well, I'd better sign up now then, might I? And... Um, I used to go to St. Matthew's, and I didn't know anyone. I come straight to Luton. I worked at the sixth form, and this was like my exodus time. Um, I don't kind of really think of that quite like that now. Um, but I didn't know anyone other than I worked with. I went along to Alpha. There was food, and then it became like a running joke. I was invited to many, many Sunday lunches. And sometimes I think, you know, I need to kind of do that as well. I don't want to say I'm completely sorted over this. But actually eating with people is, in some respects, should be stress-free because you're allowed to have, well, allowable silences. Eating, there will be natural silences. That's why I think sometimes food, I think, is very, very helpful on things like this. I've been reading through, and I wish I'd brought it here, there's um, R.T. Kendall's uh, book, The Sermon on the Mount, which is absolutely amazing. And I was just reading this chap- um, chapter last week, and I thought this will fit right into the, uh, the talk as well. It's from Matthew 5, verses 45, and it's, and it's referring to what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get now, don't you think that's funny? Jesus is saying that. What reward will you get? He's not saying salvation here. If you love those who love you, what is your reward? He's kind of saying, well, you're getting your reward ready. You're getting it on earth. But he's not referring to that reward. He's not talking about salvation either. He says, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers... What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Now, Artie Kendall calls this uncommon grace. Now, I find this quite difficult. I'm, I'm, I feel like it's like hypocritical doing this now. And I've found some of this quite challenging. Um, so I'll just put that out there as if I'm some sort of sorted person. Um, I'm paraphrasing what he's kind of saying. Are we called to be more than the sheep of our time, following the spirit of the age and following other people's examples of how not to love your neighbor? We are called to live and show uncommon grace. Uncommon grace, I mean, because it's rare. It's not what everyone else is doing. He goes on to write, what is not rare is loving those who love you. Are we truly different from the world? That is the question that Jesus is asking. What is exceedingly rare is the one who greets and mixes with those outside their comfort zones. Now, I do think some people have a natural gift for this. They're very outgoing, and, you know, my dad is very good at that, you know, to talk to everyone. But I think, before, well, I'm not like that, so I don't need to do it. And I think sometimes we use little excuses, not just to kind of step out. I think I, I'm, I'm very capable of doing that. Okay, let's now look at the, let's have a quick look at what Jesus says 
Well, how he uses Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep to correct the Pharisees' wrong thinking. Now, I am paraphrasing Luke 15, 1 to 7. This is, what, this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. You are the shepherds of Israel. Let us imagine that you have lost one of your sheep. The natural and expected response to this predicament, predicament is that you go after it. You will be thrilled when you find it and may well invite a few good friends with whom you share, who can share your joy. So in essence, he's saying, if the shepherds in the parable own the flock, then Jesus is telling the Pharisees that the tax collectors and sinners are a part of their flock. And the loss of even one of them is their, the Pharisees, loss. And that loss is significant. If the lost, as in the parable of the lost coin, is worth a day's wages, doesn't that mean that a lost person is worth even more? Jesus is blaming the Pharisees, the bad shepherds, for the lost sinners, the sheep. Remember that the shepherds' honor and reputation is at stake if they do not find the lost sheep. And I spoke about that in Psalm 23. Again, I'm paraphrasing Jesus' conversation to the Pharisees. When a shepherd loses his sheep, he naturally goes after it until he finds it. He then carries it home and has a party. It is as simple as that. The lost that I'm bringing home are the sheep that you yourself lost. I know that you don't like them and you despise me for going after them. But when they are lost, you lose because they are part of your flock. When they are found, it is your gain. Can't you see that? He is saying. Can you not join me with the great task of restoring the lost sheep of God? Now that's what I call an invitation and a half to think about. Can, can you, can we, not join with Jesus in the great task of restoring the lost sheep? Jesus is inviting us to join him in finding and rescuing the lost sheep. Now, he doesn't ask us to do this by ourselves, but invites us to go along with him by walking in step with his spirit. Now, sometimes we, like the Pharisees, can be a bit casual with the lost that are around us. And sometimes we may even feel a bit smug that we have been saved. Sometimes even a little bit self-righteous about it. Whilst the ultimate decision whether the, fa the individual whether the individual person wants to be saved rests on the person themselves. And it is an act of the Holy Spirit himself who actually does the saving. Our Heavenly Father invites each one of us to work with him and join with him in saving the lost. Right at the beginning of the sermon, I talked about the fact that sin sinners regularly drew near to Jesus that Jesus, amongst other things, took the opportunity to win people over with his kindness. So what about us? What can we do humbly and sacrificially? So how... Okay, what can we do to humbly and sacrificially show kindness to those around us? To perform acts of kindness that does not look for praise or expect something in return. Let's not be like the Pharisees who did everything so that people would praise them publicly. Let us not be slow in doing good and being a blessing to others as our Heavenly Father has been to us. How about welcoming people to our own tables and practice hospitality to those around us? One of the things that Ezekiel accused the religious leaders of not taking seriously was not looking after their own sheep. Specifically, he writes, they, had, they hadn't strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bound up the injured, brought back the strayed, and sought after the lost. As the body of Christ in Christ's church, don't we also share some responsibility or calling 
for those in our community and in our own lives. I'm just going to finish on a poem by a person unknown. To me, it wasn't not, to me, wasn't not the truth you taught, to you so clear, to me so dim. But when you came to me, you brought a sense of him. Yes, from your eyes he beckoned me, and from your heart his love was shared. And I lost sight of you and saw Christ instead. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.